Okay. Pick it back up. Um, Condominium Act of 1986. It applies to what kind of condos? Only new construction. So only new construction condos, not resales. And if I buy a new construction condo, what time period do I have to change my mind? Seven days, Seven days from the time we do what? Go under contract, right? To rescind that contract. Good, good. Only new construction. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, condos can be any type of structure, by the way, just FYI. Um, Timeshares, over on page. I'm sorry? That's right. Um, Timeshares, over on page 40 and 41. What is a timeshare in North Carolina? Use of it for five or more, what? Five or more what? Five or more separate time periods over the course of five or more years. Okay, five or more separate time periods over the course of five or more years will get you a timeshare in North Carolina. And if I buy one, do I have some time to change my mind? Five days to change my mind. Good, good. I'm sorry? It is not. Calendar days. That's exactly right. Okay? Um, I think that's it for Chapter 2. So I got a question. So legally, that means if you get it on Thursday, that means you got to be calling them by Monday, even if the company's closed on Saturday and Sunday? Yes. Day 1 would be Friday. Day 2 would be Saturday. Day 2 would be Sunday. Monday would be Day 4. Tuesday would be Day 5. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Yeah, they're not very they're not very often sold in this state because of those rules. All right, that's chapter two. Let's take a look at chapter three. So that's pretty much all that has to be Exactly. And obviously, you know, we covered a ton of material. It may not feel like it, but we just covered a ton of material. You think about how long we spend teaching life estates and we spend you know, five minutes, because once you got them, you got them. You just need to be reminded of the, the heavy points of it. That's why I think this is useful, because it goes back and it takes something that we spent, you know, an hour talking about and distills it down to five minutes, but it, it only works on the five-minute version if you know the hour-long version. You can't just, I couldn't teach it this way. You'd look at me like, what is he saying? Yeah. No, you certainly would not. No. All right, so chapter 3 deals with encumbrances or restrictions, limitations. Uh, what things are limited about our ownership of property? Um, and the first thing it, it, it mentions is a lien. And the type of liens that we deal with in this class are called specific liens. What does that mean when we have a specific lien? It is specific to that property. It attaches directly to that property and only that property. That's a specific lien. Um, and so it creates a right to do what on that property? To, a right to foreclose. A lien represents a right to foreclose. Good. Um, what is the lien priority? Do, in other words, what order do we pay liens in in North Carolina? What, what lien sits at the top? Property taxes, and then right behind that, special assessments. special assessments. And remember, special assessments are uh, anything that's levied against the property for an improvement made on the property, right? So if I am adding something of value to the property, I would probably impose a special assessment for that purpose. And a special assessment can be imposed by uh, who? Government. Some government entity. Who else? A city, who else? An HOA. A homeowners association could also impose a special assessment. Good. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So in this last election in Raleigh, it was interesting because they had a uh, transportation bond that was called, and also I think it had to do with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I happen to mention to someone that the chances of them not paying for that in the long term, because it's going to probably be a special assessment tax that's going to be added to every Raleigh citizen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's typically how they go. Yes. You put them up there, you vote for them, 
whether you vote for him yay or nay, it's still going to come to flourish anyway. Most likely. That's generally how it goes as well, right? Yes, absolutely. It comes up in front of the city council or county commissioners, and they and they vote on them and right. pass them along. I'm sorry? His question was basically how do the special assessments come into being and he was just relating it to the election that happened recently here in Raleigh when they were considering or one of the big issues is a proposed uh, uh, transportation infrastructure assessment. So, okay. Yes. So back to the lien priority, first it's taxes and then it's the assessments? Property taxes and then special assessments. And then mortgages in the order they're recorded in. And then at the very bottom would be mechanics liens. Good. Good. Does that order change when we have foreclosures? No. The order doesn't change, but something gets inserted at the top of the order. What goes at the top if it's a foreclosure sale? The cost of the sale itself. So like the trustees cost, the auction cost, any brokerage commissions, anything that it costs to actually sell the property itself, it goes in front of everything in a foreclosure sale. Okay, that's it. So the priority doesn't change, it just all gets shifted down one. Um, remember, liens are a pertinent to the title, which means if we sell the property to a new owner, what happens to the lien? It transfers. The lien transfers, stays with the property. Good, good. Um, over on page 55, we talk about easements. <clears throat> Remember, there are two main categories of easements. What are they? The appurtenant easement and the easement in gross. Okay? How do we mostly recognize an easement in gross? What is the most common type of easement in gross? The most likely one you would see? A utility easement. All right. What is the defining characteristic of an easement in gross? It's going to go away at some point in time, okay? So, let's, so which means an appurtenant easement, what? Never goes away. How many properties are involved with an appurtenant easement? Two. two, and always two. How many properties are involved with an easement in gross? Just one at a time, but it could be as many as you want, right? But they're all individual. Appurtenant easements have what we call the servient tenement and the dominant tenement, correct? Because there are two properties. If there's only one property with an easement in gross, do we have servient and dominant? Nope. No. We just have which one? Servient. Just servient. Just servient. There is no dominant tenement with an easement in gross. Because the servient tenement is always the one where the easement is located. If you think about servient dominant, servient's where the easement's located. Well, in an easement in gross, you only have one property, so the easement must be on that one property. Just servient tenements. Yes. Everything can go away. That's not the way you should view it. The purpose of an appurtenant easement. See, you're in the weeds instead of the forest. You just bumped your head on a tree because you were looking at the flower, right? The, the defining characteristic of an appurtenant easement, and the only thing you need to worry about for purposes of this exam, is that it doesn't go away. It lasts forever. Because that's the big thing. That's the big ticket difference. Of course, there are 40 different ways they can go away because there's always going to be legal actions and court cases and all that. But in your mind, the way you should associate it, permanent, lasts forever. An easement. That's, I'm telling you, that's not a category to think about. That's what I'm telling you. It, 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 you. You don't need to get that deep because what you need to know about easements as far as termination is do they automatically terminate? There's only one case that would automatically terminate an easement. So death of an easement holder and an easement in gross would certainly terminate an easement. What's another automatic termination of an easement? If you buy both properties in what type of an easement? And an appurtenant easement. That's a merger, right? If you have a merger and an appurtenant easement, that, is there anything else that automatically terminates an easement? No. Whether it's an easement appurtenant or an easement in gross, they just don't terminate automatically. Okay? Good. Um, let's see what else we got here in Chapter 3. 
Um, on page 58, we talk about property taxes in North Carolina. What is the property tax calendar? First of all, the Machinery Act gives us the authority to tax. Okay, so what is the property tax calendar in North Carolina? When do property taxes become a lien on our property? January 1 of the current year. Okay, so the 2017 taxes have been a lien since January 1 of 2017. When do they become delinquent? January 6th. They have to be paid by the 5th, but they're delinquent on the 6th of the following year. Good. North Carolina uses ad valorem full market value taxes. We express our rate as dollars per hundred, which is the same thing as a percentage, right? Some other states express their rate as mill rates. How do you convert a mill rate to a North Carolina tax rate? Divide it by 10, right? Divide it by 10. Okay. To convert a mill rate to a North Carolina tax rate, you divide by 10. To convert a North Carolina tax rate to a mill rate, you multiply by 10. Okay, good. Um, what do we call it when, you, when we go and reassess the value of the property once every eight years? It's called an octennial reappraisal. Good. And we can change the value across the board, up or down, by a flat percentage every how often? four years, that's called a horizontal adjustment. Horizontal adjustment. And that taxation timetable is on page 63, but they make it much more complex. You know, they've got too many dates on there. January 1st of this year and January 5th of the following year. That's ex the exact, or the next year, rather. That's exactly right. And then obviously make sure you can do the math of, we're not going through math in this review today, but make sure you can do the math of property tax calculations and mill rate calculations. Those are going to be um, big. Okay? Good. Um, that is it for Chapter 3. Chapter 4, super short. What kind of real property description do we use in North Carolina? Uh, meets and bounds. Absolutely. We use meets and bounds property descriptions in North Carolina. That is our legal method of describing property. A meets and bounds description consists of monuments, right? And then these, they call them calls, the directions. What's the key to a meets and bounds description? You must end at the same place you started, right? Point of beginning should also be the point of ending. That's how you recognize a good meets and bounds property description. Now, in other states, what kind of description do they use? The government rectangular survey system. And Michaela is an expert. She runs past it every day. What matters in the government rectangular survey? Sections and townships. How big is a section? 640 acres or one square mile. Either one. It's the same thing, right? One square mile is 640 acres. So a piece of land one mile wide by one mile deep is 640 acres, that is one section. How many sections are there in a township? 36. 36 of them. Good. With the math of the government rectangular survey, make sure you know how to break down that 640 acre section based on the quarters and halves so that you can get total number of acres for a piece of land. Is everybody good with that? Okay. Um, on Also in uh, chapter 4, we talk about the reference to a recorded plat map. That's another method of describing property in North Carolina, and that's most commonly used in what areas of the state? Ur the urban. urban areas, because they've been done, they've what's happened to them a lot. They've been subdivided, and remember, a subdivision is a plat map. 
Okay. Last thing in uh, chapter four, we talk about the necessity to disclose street status. Um, I'm not even actually sure. Is that in chapter four? No, it's actually in chapter six, I think. But we can talk about it here. Do we have to disclose the status of streets when we sell a property? What, what two statuses can they have? Public or they are public or they are private. How many steps does a developer have to go through to make them from public or from private to public? Two steps. What are they called? Dedication. They have to dedicate the streets for public use and acceptance. The streets have to be accepted by the state for public use. So the developer's piece is called dedication. The state's piece is called what? Acceptance. acceptance. And until those two things have been accomplished, are they public or are they private? private. They are private. Good. Do we have to disclose that status? Yes. yes. Absolutely. I'm not sure. I just remembered it off the top of my head. I think it's in chapter 6 somewhere. Oh, let me find that page number. Um, page 120, Michaela. Mm -hmm. And it took them three pages to do what we just did in 30 seconds. Dedication. Mm -hmm. And the second step is acceptance. All right, chapter 5. Told you chapter 4 is super short. We're on the express path now. Chapter 5, deeds, transfer of title. What is a deed? It's the way we do what? Transfer a title. It is the mechanism which we transfer a title. What are the three main categories of deeds that we deal with in the class? Wow. General warranty. Special warranty. Yeah. And quick claim. What is the difference between the three of them? What is the primary difference between the three of them? The level of what? Not... Well, time you get in there. Level of guarantee that's coming from who? The from the grantor, because you use deed words, right? Use your deed words, grantor and grantee. So the level of guarantee coming from the grantor to the grantee. A general warranty deed guarantees against any problems, any title issues for what period of time? Forever. Forever. A special warranty deed guarantees against any problems for what period of time? Just the period of time the grantor owned the property. A quick claim deed guarantees against what? Nothing. No guarantee. In fact, there's not even a guarantee that we what? Well, that we own it. What are quick claim deeds most commonly used for? Clear defects, to, to repair defects, to repair clouds on the title. That's what we use them most commonly for is to clear up any questions about title. It's the most common use for a quit claim deed. Okay. How about deeds? Do they have to be recorded? Are they subject to the Connor Act? Yes. yes. And what does that mean? They have to be recorded to be what? to be enforceable in a court of law. So when do deeds become enforceable on third parties? Once they're recorded. That's exactly right. At closing, the recording of the documents. Remember, closing is recording. So when are people entitled to monies and all that kind of stuff? At closing, which is when we record the documents. Don't think of closing as the meeting, right? When the people get together. Closing is when the documents are recorded. Okay. Everybody good there? Nice. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Is 
is when the attorney goes to the county courthouse and records. Settlement's the meeting. There you go. That's exactly right. Settlement is the meeting. Closing is when the documents are recorded. Um, you don't need to worry about any of those special types of deeds. If you know the three main categories, I think you'll be in good shape. Um, now on page 95, they get into uh, involuntary alienation. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's the settlement date. Usually they're the same, usually the same date. I mean, we usually leave the settlement and go directly to the county courthouse and record. But if we close very late in the afternoon, if we do the settlement very late in the afternoon, they may not make it in time. So they could be two different days. There, that, there's a reason we don't want to have closings on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock because we may not make it to the courthouse to get documents recorded. And if you don't, when do they own the house? Monday. On Monday. They're not going to be real happy with that. County courthouse, whatever county you're in. So if you're selling a property in Wake County, you got to go to the Wake County courthouse. But you're buying a property in Buncombe County, they've got to go all the way to Buncombe County to record those documents. That's exactly right. Uh, Ash's question is, can you do it online? Very relatively few county courthouses in North Carolina accept electronic recording. Uh, Wake County is one of them that does. Um, but most of them you have to physically still go to the courthouse, which is why if you go in any small town, all the real estate attorney's offices are usually within throwing a rock of the county courthouse so that they can just run out and run over there and do their recording. Okay. Um, a, uh, involuntary alienation on page 96, 97. These are ways that you could lose ownership against your will. So we talk about the escheat. What is an escheat? Die without a will. State takes your property because they couldn't find what? Any heirs for you. They looked real hard. They couldn't find any. And it goes to the state. It is sheets. What is eminent domain? So your property is condemned, right, by who? The government entity for public good taken for public use. That is called eminent domain. Whatever piece they need. That's exactly right. Okay? Good. What is an adverse possession? That's an involuntary alienation. When you use the property illegally for 20 years. Not use it. That's right. Claim it as my own for 20 years. And the reason I have to be careful not to say use it for 20 years illegally because if I'm just using it for 20 years illegally, what might I get rather than adverse possession? Uh, I might get an easement by prescription, right? So we want to be careful to say that we've actually claimed ownership. We've taken the property for 20 years openly, continuously, exclusively, and without permission, right? Those are the ones. Okay. Openly, continuously, exclusively, and without permission. Those are the, that's what you have to remember. Is everybody good there? That's an adverse possession. All right. I think that's it for the involuntary alienations. Over on page 99, we talk about recording and the necessity for recording, which we are, we've already mentioned, when these things become effective, they become effective at recording. Um, who does a title search in North Carolina? Closing, Closing attorneys. attorneys. And what is a chain of title? Uh, it's the abstract of titles that you show you right from the beginning to the end. It's just a layout of here's the transfers from beginning to end. What is marketable title? Title without a cloud is exactly right. Unblemished title is marketable title. North Carolina has a marketable title act, which basically means that claims are only valid for how long? 30. 30 years. If you haven't exercised your claim within 30 years, it is extinguished. It's gone. Okay? And again, what law says we have to record certain documents for them to be enforceable? Conrad. The Conner Act. Also on page 106, 107, make sure you're good with the math of calculating excise taxes. Don't... Uh,
There's no confusion. They're the same thing. Okay. Same thing. Okay. Yep. No need to confuse. All right. We good with chapter six? I mean five. Okay. Then let's take a quick loose, a quick look at chapter six. So in chapter six, we deal with land use controls. The first example of that is zoning. Okay, zoning. Who enforces the zoning in a particular area? Usually your local government, right? Municipality. Zoning sets up allowed uses. What do we call a use that's not allowed by the zoning? What do we call it? An illegal use. Unless it started before the zoning came into effect, and then we call it what? That's a legal non-conforming use. So the only difference between an illegal use and a legal non-conforming use is what? When it started. The timing. An illegal use is one that started after the rules said you couldn't do it. A legal non-conforming use started before the rules went into place. Is everybody good on that? What's an extraterritorial jurisdiction? That's that buffer between cities that the, one of the cities can um, control the zoning. Right, so it's outside of their city limits, but they still have what? Zoning control. They still have control of the property even though it's outside of their city limits. And it could be up to three miles. That's exactly right. Good. Good. Um, do we have to disclose zoning on property? What it's zoned for? Is that a material fact? Yes. Absolutely. Um, also in this chapter is the subdivision process on page 118, 119. So what you need to know about the subdivision process is really when we can start to market these properties. So the two key time periods are here are when we record the preliminary plat map and when we record the what? Final. The final plat map. So before we record the preliminary plat map, what can you do as a broker as far as marketing that property? Pretty much nothing, right? You can take their name and call them back once we do have a preliminary plat map. What can you do once a preliminary plat map is recorded? Deposits. Show the property. What else? We write a contract on it? Absolutely. Everything but, that's the right answer. I love that answer. He said you can do everything but close. Preliminary plat map recorded. There's no such thing as approved. It's either recorded or not recorded. So preliminary plat map recorded, you can start the selling process. You can take deposits. You can write contracts. Sean said you can do everything but what? Close. Everything but close. What do you have to do to close? You have to file or record the final plat map. So on the exam, should I, should I look at it both ways? Because I got that from, it says you have to have the preliminary plat approval before selling. Preliminary approval in that sense is recording. So, so I can look at it that way. No, okay. I'm telling you on the test, they'll say recorded. Okay. The Real Estate Commission is not nearly as wishy washy as that book with their verbiage. I would love to say not nice things about the people who write this book, but I won't. I'll refrain. I'm on video. And they might see it. Okay? Is everybody good with that? So we would need a final plat map to do what? Close. To close. Transfer ownership. Good. Good. All right, on page 120, there's your subdivision street disclosures that we talked about a few minutes ago. All right. Um, 
on page 124 and 125, make sure you understand the building code and the building permit process in North Carolina. What is a building permit? Permission to build. And what is a certificate of occupancy? It, it, no, nah, it's not that. It's not. It has anything, nothing to do with inhabiting or. It, it's been completed according to what? The building codes. A certificate of occupancy is proof that you've complied with the building codes, that you've built it according to those building codes. Because the permit comes before you build and the certificate of occupancy comes once they've come and inspected what you built to make sure it complies. Um, on page 126, we get into private land use controls. What are the most common examples of private land use controls? So, uh, restrictions. restrictions. Yeah, you say HOA. I prefer not to put the term HOA in there because remember, an HOA doesn't have to exist. What, what's the, what, what are HOA restrictions? What are they actually? They're called covenants, right? They're called covenants. I don't want you to continually make this association that the only place that has rules are places where we have an HOA. The vast majority of subdivisions that have covenants don't have homeowners associations. And that will put you in perilous danger of missing a question on the test. Don't you think the Real Estate Commission knows that that dynamic exists, that you assume that there has to be an HOA? So... Would they put that as an answer choice when they ask you about who has to enforce these covenants? That it has to be the HOA. Guess what? Wrong. Who enforces covenants? Individual owners within that subdivision. That's the answer. How many of them? All or just one, right? Only takes one. Do you have to have an HOA to enforce these covenants? No. Absolutely not. Any owner within that neighborhood is free to enforce the covenants on any other owner within that neighborhood. How about if we have a, a, a conflict between the covenants and zoning? Now, zoning comes from the government. We should pay more attention to that, right? Salim said, whichever one's more restrictive. What do y'all think about that? That's the one you follow. You follow the most restrictive one. In other words, that's another way of saying you follow both, right? Because if your mom says you got to be in by 8 and your dad says you got to be in by 9, what time do you have to be in? 8. eight. <laughs> because if you follow the most restrictive one, aren't you complying with both sets of rules, yes. right? If zoning says you can have any fence and the covenant says it has to be a wood fence, what kind of fence can you put up? A wood fence because that complies with either set of rules. So, in one way is to say most restrictive, the other way is just to say all of them. I've got to follow all the rules all the time. I can't go against any of them. I mean, even if it's a direct conflict, one says you can't have a fence, the other says you can. What can you do? No fence. No fence. That's exactly right. So, so, Travis, so you said when we think about private restrictions, private um, covenants. Covenants and restrictions mean the same thing. Yep. Covenants and restrictive, because they're really called restrictive covenants. Okay? Is everybody good on those? Who would normally, in, who would normally place the covenants on a property? Yeah. Owner, which happens to be the developer in a lot of cases, right? Good. Good. Mm -hmm. I know zoning is created by the government, so, but what if the owner wanted to, oh, never mind, that would be a covenant, I guess. That would be a covenant, that's exactly right. So there are lots of, and there are lots of neighborhoods that have exactly those kinds of covenants where they restrict the color that homes can be. In fact, there are a lot of neighborhoods when you start pulling the covenants will have like an attached color palette. 
that the house has to be one of these six colors and it can't be the same color as any of the three houses on either side it can't repeat and you know and it can't be the same color as a house directly opposing it so any any given homeowner might only have a choice of like two colors you know when they look at the other ones around them so yeah you could have those kinds of covenants for sure and if you do it without you know following those rules they could make you do what Paint it over. If you put up a fence and it's not allowed, they can make you yeah. take it down. Yes? I'm, uh, with, with zoning, you need to know, uh, do you know what an illegal use is? Do you know what a legal non-conforming use is? Do you know what an extraterritorial jurisdiction is? Do you know who enforces zoning? Do you know what happens when there's a conflict between zoning and restrictive covenants? Okay, we good on that? Where do you find covenants? Where would you find anything that relates to a property? Title. You do a title search, and where do you do that? Where are those documents? Where are they recorded? At the county courthouse. So where would you find covenants? At the county courthouse. That's where they are. Luckily for us, they give us access to those documents online, so we don't have to physically go down there anymore. We used to. But they are physically there at the county courthouse. Okay? That's the purpose of recording, to make them available. That's constructive notice, to make them available to the public. Okay? Good on Chapter 6? All right? So why don't we stop there and take a break? We're going to take our lunch break.